God, you tell us to live in your will, following your ways, in love, even to live contrary to the world in which we live, regardless of what it takes. Because much of the church in the world we live shows little difference to the secular or moral nature of what you came to condemn. We're attempting to please you by worshiping in a small home group as you perhaps originally intended. In many places in Scripture, you highlight those worshiping in their homes. You say in Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, that where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among you. We are indeed gathering in your name, Lord Jesus. Paul writes no less than a dozen times about his teaching in homes and many being gathered in homes. We attempt today to please you and worship you as a family. First, Lord, we repent of original sin. Our ancestors chose to take upon themselves to determine between right and wrong by eating the fruit in the garden against your will. This was done even though you had offered to see our every need and give us joy, peace, and happiness in paradise. Yet despite our sin, you still gave us a chance at redemption. Even in the same breath while condemning Eve and the serpent, you promised a restoration of the intended order by sending your only son, Jesus, to set the example, teach, fulfill all scripture, die for us, spill his blood as a once and for all sin offering. Those accepting these facts and verbalizing them to God are saved in him. Help us to learn to live as people saved. All we can offer is our willingness. The work of holiness in us must come from you. Amen. Let's prepare to hear the word of God by calling to mind our sin and confessing them in the silence of our hearts. We'll read from the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah. Therefore the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. And also a reading from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15. Then the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they don't wash their hands when they eat bread. He, Jesus, answered them and said, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition, hypocrites? Well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, these people draw near to me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. But when he called the multitude unto himself, he said, Hear and understand, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a man. For that which proceeds out of the mouth comes from the heart. Out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Uh, the Lord has placed this message heavy on my heart lately because I wrestle with the idea of serving the Lord with my life and the qualifications to do so. Sometimes I have these thoughts like, in order for me to be holy enough to serve Him, I have to, with my own strength, quit smoking cigarettes. And uh, after I do that, then I'll be worthy of the calling to serve Him. I'm, I'm so, you know, sometimes I feel so disgusting, you know. Um, I'm a lover of comfort and pleasure. I can sit down and eat a half gallon of ice cream in a night. Uh, I stay asleep sometimes when my kids need me to get up or my wife needs me to get up and share responsibilities with her. Surely this is not the kind of person that God would call. I'm too much of a glutton to be a servant. I'm impatient. Sometimes I yell at my children. I take more from my mother than I give. I'm too lazy to be a follower of Jesus. I'm foul. And my thoughts, I can be critical, mean, resentful, even to family. The Bible condemns all these things. But this sounds like all of us, doesn't it? Yet he still calls us. He calls us to be blessings to people every day. Whether it's saying God bless you to somebody when you get off the phone with them, or holding the door, making eye contact with a cashier at the grocery store, not engaging in office and neighborhood gossip, not cursing when a cut or wood or task doesn't turn out. But listen, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the call. And he calls all of us, not just some of us. If we can't get past our own sin to follow him, regardless, with our whole heart, we don't really believe in him, that he forgives us uh, of our sin. 
when we think we can change ourselves to be worthy to go before him uh, and to approach God, what we're saying is I don't believe Jesus actually died for my sins. I believe that in some way I can prepare myself to go before God. But if that was true, there'd be no need for Jesus to have come. If we could make ourselves right uh, for God, if there was ever a proof that God is holy and perfect, it's this. If there's no God, why do we act as if we must achieve some kind of level before we can approach Him? But we can't. And even if we succeed in eliminating every vice and bad thought, we would still fall short. Jesus really is the only way. He picks the vile, the broken, and the emptied out. And often brokenness and desperation are exactly what God looks for because they are willing to not try and do things their own way, but they're willing to follow God and do things His way. To let God do the sanctifying and the changing and the teaching. We spend the bulk of our time worrying over what goes into our bodies and into our mouths. But in our reading today, we see in Isaiah 29 a God longing for true love from His people. But the religious leaders of the day are teaching the wrong kind of fear. They're teaching rules and regulations, doctrines and traditions. God says, you draw near to me with your mouths, but your hearts are far away. You learn rules, but not the love of God. We see that in today's Western church. Come, join, give your tithe, play a silly game. We'll teach you a scripture about how Jesus loves you. But if you're lucky, maybe one or two of the people in that church can actually show you how to live that from experience. Look at the very first sin. Yes, there was a consequence, but when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, what does it tell us God did? It says God was walking through the garden in the cool of the evening and called out for Adam. It doesn't say he burst into the garden with the wrath and, and, and mercilessness of power and crushed them like wax. We even see God's mercy in those instances. In, the, in a sense, uh, God was relaxed and in total control. Even in handing his punishment to Eve and the serpent, he gave the hope of redemption. Cain murdered his brother and was as belligerent to God about it as he could be, but God still gave him the hope by placing a mark on his head that we often look at as an evil, the mark of Cain. But it was a mark of protection, so that when people came on Cain, they saw the mark of God upon his head and wouldn't injure him. To try to fix yourself before coming to him is the exact same thing as saying, I got this. I'll take it upon myself to choose between right and wrong. I'll eat the fruit. We simply need to come to him as we are. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Jesus did not say, fix this and that before you come seek me. He says, come follow me. And the apostles, as they were maybe with broken bones and bodies, mental illnesses, maybe they were gay, maybe they were alcoholics, maybe they were drug addicts. They were us. And they weren't celebrated for achieving a level of holiness. They were celebrated for not saying a word, but just getting up and following him. He tolerated their defects of character, and in some cases, many cases, used them for his glory. Sure, yes, he changed them in time, sanctified them, but they were just like us. So let me ask you, what allowed God to overlook Abraham trying to pass his wife off as his sister, which could have overthrown the Pharaoh of Egypt? What allowed God to overlook that Jacob was a schemer that stole his brother's inheritance? What allowed God to overlook that Joseph cast lots and married Potipharah, the daughter of the priest of the Egyptian priesthood, a cult which God hated? What allowed God to overlook David's murder and adultery? What allows him to overlook your excuses as to why you haven't given yourself over to him completely? Why you haven't prayed? Why aren't you reading the Bible? Why, So you can hear what he has to say to you. And I'm talking to myself here too. We're forever going, gee, I wonder what God's will is for me. But I can tell you that unless you're in prayer and scripture, he's not speaking to your heart. It takes all three. These people we spoke about from Scripture loved God. They knew their condition, and they did not let it hold them back from following Him. They begged Him at times, pleaded, but loved Him. Do you think Jeremiah was happy when he said, Lord, a prophet? Uh, but, but I thought I'd like to have a wife. No, Jeremiah, I've told you to be a prophet. But Lord, 
I, I want a family. No, Jeremiah, I have called you to be a prophet. Or, or maybe when Noah goes to God and says, God, I've been working on this boat, and a couple of my neighbors came, and they're, they're willing. They're will- no, Noah, they are not getting on the ark. Or when Moses says, God, who am I to go to Pharaoh? Moses, you're going to Pharaoh, and you just tell him that I am sent you. None of these people were holy or righteous. They were just like us, sinners. But they were willing. That, that's all it took. They were willing to simply follow God, follow Jesus at any cost. Abraham straight up left his homeland and took his entire tribe of people with him on God's word alone. Noah spent his entire fortune building a boat in the middle of a dry land where it had never rained before. They accepted how sinful they were and they didn't try to change themselves for God, but they let God guide them and change them. They knew they were defiled, the things that came out of their mouths and What they had done, they all sinned greatly and were full of defects, but their relationship with God was more important than their earthly desire and self-loathing about sin and unworthiness. Our mission is to let our yes be yes and our no be no. We must monitor what comes out of our mouths at any cost. Our tongues can dig our graves. So we don't need to spend time thinking about how unworthy we are and all these things we have to do before we can go to him. We just have to go to him and let him be in charge. And remember that he doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And we are called. Yes, we have to accept how sinful we are. Purposely try not to sin. Even if we were perfectly clean and took every step to remove every vice and defect in our life, though, we would still be vile before a holy God. We would still need a Savior. So let's pray, read our scripture, ask God to show us the way. We should be moved with utter gratitude that we can still be saved despite all this. All we have to do is confess out loud in the presence of God that we acknowledge that God sent his only begotten son to die, that he was crucified, died, buried for our sins, and that he rose again in fulfillment of scripture to save us. We truly are saved by his blood and resurrection. All right, let's pray.